miss anything? How, okay. how have you how have you been? Well, uh, life here has been um, unpredictable, interesting. Uh, I'm. Uh, it hasn't turned out quite the way I expected, but that's life. Never does. Yeah. So, uh, but no, I've kind of. I'm no longer uh, working with the museums that I thought I was going to work with. Part of that, it's a long story. You can pick up a bit of it in the recent essay I wrote on my Gravity from Above site. But, uh, but basically, though, I'm still staying here, and okay. uh, and it's just uh you know it's like i you know i realized at a certain point i'm not getting out of it anything out of this other thing but there are all these other things here i am getting something out of and they're good enough to make me just go like okay let's just cut the cut uh what we're not supposed to be doing and do what we are supposed to be doing so i look at it as a good it, it was like god's joke with me to get me <laughs> you know, not on me but with me yeah you know, so because I, as soon as certain things happen, uh, as soon as I found out about them, e even like going back months, I, I, as soon as I did it, I just started laughing and not because I just, it wasn't just that it was absurd. It was just like, okay, yeah, that was a good chess move to get me here. <laughs> Play it on my ego a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. But, but it's, I don't know, you're, you've had such an interesting life and I, I, I very much admire your your devotion to um, your devotion to the art and the arts and and the art of following and you know I you know I don't listen to all your stuff but you know I can I can sense the struggle in terms of well shoot guys got to eat George is a little cheaper but you know you know you you're not you know you're not you're not jordan peterson getting ten thousand oh, dollars no. a month on patreon um, oh no oh no <laughs> but, but i but fortunately the the you know the people i have had on my account have kept helped keep me afloat whether they know it or not you know okay. um just through a lot you know I've, i realized how much money i spent getting here putting my stuff in storage renting all this money i could have used for something back in alaska yeah, uh, but I say no. It's right though. You know, it's like um, it, it's it. You know, and part of it is also it's so easy when you get older to fall into certain habits just because they're comfortable. Yeah. And uh, I felt myself kind of slipping that way, and I just said, no, it's time to stick my finger in the electrical socket. <laughs> you know time to just you know and it was great i had some friends visiting i took them up into the high caucuses which are absolutely astounding i mean you're at like seven eight thousand feet and you're looking on either side of you in this narrow valley and it's just going up on either side it's just the smoothest pasture land going mm. up another three thousand feet mm. And uh, people, I was in this small village uh, with just all this ancient stone uh, fences and stuff. It was really quiet, and I was with my friends. We were going to stay in this larger uh, place that was uh, had more like tourist uh, amenities. But I was so glad I, I chose this smaller place because I was just so cool. There were people driving cows through the village, and and you could just look up in the mountains. Then way off, you'd see the really tall, like fifteen hundred, fifteen thousand foot. Uh, mountains and stuff and it was just like wow so but it was just uh that helped kind of renew my sense okay man, that's part of what i'm doing here because I, yeah. I haven't really explored that much uh, i had a lot of mountains in alaska so i wasn't really rushing to go do that well the mountains don't go anywhere um, no you know unless yeah. somebody with the kind of faith that jesus talks about tells them to up and move short of that yeah um <laughs> they're, they're, they're staying put <laughs> seeds about this big and, uh, <laughs> sometimes i wish i had that much <laughs> that's right that's right that's right yeah. well and and some of the pictures and video that you've sent of georgia you know just seems to be a a fascinating country you know beautiful country it's not a place that north americans think about much except of course no. it's where stalin came from but you know right, beyond right. that um, I mean, do they, do people even know that these days, yeah, you know, it's like, that's true. uh, I mean, you ask someone say under 40 years old, you know, what do you know about Georgia? Uh, maybe they know more now because it's starting to get a little 
press. But um, but speaking of Georgia, I just started a new a, a, th a third YouTube channel uh, called Georgian Crossroads, and I've put up one uh, kind of introductory video on it. I'm about to put up the one called Basic Facts of Georgia, but uh, I've got tons of stuff. But it's it's kind of like juggling this. But now that I'm no longer thinking about the museums and stuff. I'm getting a regular rhythm for how to produce videos more and such. So, well, and and you've obviously got some mad editing skills for for resurrecting and saving that video of the Joker that I did. I really appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the things I've learned. I'm. Uh, did you have a chance to watch my video on the Joker? Yes, I did. Uh, I thought it was tremendous. I thought yeah, it was. You'll notice it was I so applied helpful. Applied some of my editing skills, especially in the first couple of seconds. There, I have all the Jokers laughing at the same time over each other. Yeah, <laughs> I, I thought that was a tremendous video. I, you know, I knew nothing. I mean, I, I love talking to you because it's sort of like visiting the library or, or Googling some interesting things because you have so much knowledge of so many areas that I know so little about that. And, you know, the, the, the tradition and the history around clowns and jesters, I thought all of that was just so tremendously helpful. Yeah, well, uh, uh, part of it is because I've been interested in puppets for a long time. But going back before that, I've been interested in horror films for, for you know, since I was young. And I'm also interested in, you know, fantasy, science fiction. And I'm interested in just plain history. So mm -hmm. it's like I juggle these things. And the way I look at my knowledge is... Yeah, you, your, um, your video froze for me, but your audio was still coming through. We'll see if we we'll see if we still have you. Well, I, you know, I, when <laughs> when when you dropped out, I thought could be the internet. Although they've been working on the internet here, so mine hasn't been too great here at church lately. But also could just be the power because when I lived in the Dominican Republic, you know, the power would go off, the power would come yeah, on, yeah, yeah. and we didn't no, even have just, internet. Uh, so. I th I think I have a very old uh, modem. So it's, it's just very funky. And uh, I just have to kind of go over, turn it off and on, let it reboot. But first I have to, you know, I try it here and then I go over there anyway. So where were we? We're so talking where about- were we? We're talking Joker. about, well, you're, you're, you, you had an interest not only in, in puppetry, which gets right. no respect, but also, cause I was listening to somebody else and they were, I mean, puppetry just gets no respect, but then clowns. And I thought it was so, and, and also horror films which right. is unusual because to me they're you know, all connected and yeah well and uh, i i'd like to know more about how they're connected and i really was interested in you know punch and judy how that came through i thought you brought that through nicely in your yeah, video yeah. And well that's punch and judy is something that you know knowing cl uh, puppet history the way i do it's just like second nature to me to know that and and once you know the story of punch and judy as i as i mentioned in the video punch and judy comes from the uh, italian commedia dell'arte which involved the masks and the masks come from the carnivals and the carnivals like the venice carnival still has the mask today and in fact they've become more popular in the last few years and i think it's partly because we've entered this very strange time where the mask has taken on a new significance in culture so whether it's Antifa or the clown mask like you saw in the Joker movie or, you know, or the, the, Hong, Kong, kid, the Hong Kong, the Hong Kong protests, yeah. they're all, they're I mean, and it's, masks. yep. And it's a, you know, it's obviously for Antifa in Hong Kong, it's a very pragmatic attempt right. to mask identity. Exactly. But, exactly. but this is all, but it's still there. That's right. Yeah. I mean, if you remember the sixties, it wasn't there. Right. Even though right. there was there was a lot of uh, you know protesting and marches, and was wearing masks. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And, and uh, I've actually been thinking a lot about the origin of this particular time, and I think a lot of it goes back to Seattle in 1999. Uh, there was that big uh, upset protest then that had to do with left wing kind of stuff, and they had they they brought puppets to it, this big cardboard turtle and stuff like that. And that was connected to the earlier kinds of protests, but it started something new at that point. And I think we would have seen a lot more of that at the beginning of the, uh, the aughts had we not had September 11th. And then what happened was once we got to about 2008, Barack Obama 
suddenly this stuff slowly started coming back in more and more. Although in Europe, it was kind of uh, had was mutating. That's where you get the Antifa and all the rest of it. So, but anyway, the, the clowns and puppets to me, oh, I mean, to me, the most fascinating thing about the clown, as I point out in that uh, video, is that we live in the most fun, obsessed age there ever was. You know, um, I think it was Pascal said, you know, people live for diversion. They would rather, he was talking about uh, playing pool. He said they'd rather push a ball around in a, on a table than they would think about their lives and think about God. You know, uh, he said the hardest thing for anyone is to sit in their room for an afternoon alone. <laughs> so we live in this very strange age where we have endless distractions. And we've also, these distractions, they, they tempt us back into this, well, you know, so we use the word adult pests, or you know, uh, there are other words to describe this prolonged juvenile uh, period that people are now going through. Um, when I was young, you didn't meet people who, uh, there was nobody who was like, acted like children for so long, you know, who, you know, play, I mean, yeah, people play board with their family, but it wasn't like an obsession the way video games are. They might be into movies, but if they were, for instance, in the 60s and 70s, the way people were into movies was on a very scholarly level. You know, I mean, that was like the heyday of, of film scholarship, really, and, and film cri uh, criticism. And uh, you had all these repertory theaters and people would go. And I remember going to see Fellini films and Bergman. Uh oh went into everything was Star Wars mm -hmm. and that started uh, uh, everything where we have where we are now you know Star Wars kind of starts this new kind of culture it wasn't obvious at the time because I think most of the Star Wars fans were like me or like a lot of people are in Georgia uh, it's just a fun movie you know you just went and saw it oh that was nice but you lived there Whereas now people live in Star Wars. They live in the Marvel comic universe. They live in the DC universes. You know, they live in all these things, which is what makes the Joker such an interesting film. Because the Joker says, you can't live here. And that's the <laughs> first film to come along and say that. It doesn't tempt you. You'd have to be an idiot to want to live in that world. Right. You know, right. I mean, it goes back, what it does is it goes back to the 70s and picks up that dark time. I like what you were saying. I heard your uh, video today where you're talking about, you know, Patterson, New Jersey. There was New Jersey, and they went and filmed in New Jersey. And, you know, I, I, we were both, we remember those times in New York yep. one yep. way or another. Yep. And, you know, those were not, uh, you know, those were darker times. Oh, they were. They were. <laughs> and, yeah. And, uh, well, were you, know, you in New uh, York during the Bernie Getz shooting? I mean, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. I mean, that was yeah. a huge deal in New York oh, during yeah. that time. And when I, and so when I saw that scene in the Joker movie, it's like, oh, this is a very interesting sure. twist sure. on Bernard Getz and the mm -hmm. subway shooting. And the big, you know, you know, that was, you know, it's, it's weird because the 60s are really sort of 65 to 75 and the 70s are really sort of 75 to 85 you know, when it comes to New York, and then after, you know, the late 80s, you have the, the friendification of New York, and, sure. and Rudy Giuliani, who, of course, takes on whole yeah. new meanings well, today. Well, it's, it's the, it's the, they, they were still dark in the 90s. I left in 96, and in 96, as I was leaving, I could feel it all starting to change. Really? And becoming, it's becoming the new, like, the shopping mall New York. Yes, you yes. Know? And you had these big stores coming in, and you had uh, Times Square was changing into whatever it is now, this big yeah. chaotic jumble of screens and sounds and noise. And there's most commercial stores on earth. You know, I remember when you could go to Times Square and, you know, you'd go into some arcade and get, get an ID, a fake ID made for yourself, or you could go to some store that had like, they were having sales on rugs they were getting rid of and, and another store that had all these like weird trinkets, but it wasn't, it wasn't a hard rock cafe. Right. You know, it wasn't right. the, you know, the, the uh, major league baseball, you know, that, that kind of thing. It wasn't these huge franchises that came squatting down there. 
Well, and, and yeah. so, you know, in the, in the late seventies, you know, kids from our Christian school would sneak over to Times Square to go in the peep shows. And, oh, yeah. and so then when I, when I, I hadn't been, so I left, you know, I went to college in 81 and then I was back and forth in New Jersey until about 90 when I went to the Dominican Republic, got married in 88. And after that, you know, 90, I went to the Dominican Republic. And so then it wasn't until 2006 that I got to New York City and I'd grown up there and I, I went there with a bunch of guys who hadn't been to New York much. But what was so funny, the prevailing, you know, inside joke throughout that trip in 2006 was I didn't know the city at all because the city right. had completely transformed from what mm -hmm. from the city that I had known into this sure. other. And, and the Joker movie sort of, you know, uh, you know it, you you're exactly right. It just, it just put us right back and it was like, wow. Right. It was, well, it, here, it, go ahead. Here's the interesting thing about Todd Phillips, the director. A lot of people immediately will say, well, he directed movies like Old School and these other comedies and stuff. And some of those, like The Hang On Old School, are pretty um, nihilistic on a certain level. Yes, they and are. And I don't think that's an accident. And here's the important thing. His first was a documentary on the most scabrous punk rock mission there ever was, G.G. Allen, who used to take his clothes off, defecate on stage, and throw the audience. The documentary about these, these the really the, the most low-life punks you can possibly imagine, uh, following this guy until he eventually killed himself. And he killed himself about a block away from where I live. So, you know, and I was there at the time. So, so all of, you know, I, I've seen that documentary once and it was just like, oh, strong, that's a strong drink of, of uh, medicine because it's, it's about how dark things got. So he was connecting with this early, late 80s, early 90s in New York was actually a very interesting time culturally. We don't have a name for this time. Right now, I just use the phrase postmodern. Uh, we talk about alternative music and stuff, but it was really a time, it was the, the end kind of the beginning of New York's, if, if let's say we could bracket it something like the post-war era, you had Jackson Pollock and you had, you know, uh, Willem de Kooning and all these artists, you had uh, the beat poets and all of this, and this whole period with different waves of different kinds of, you know, hippies and punks and all this stuff, uh, different kinds of artists, art scenes and such, performance artists uh, and whatnot. And this period, I came in in 1982 and left in 96, but by about 94, you could feel uh, 94, 95, it was ending. Mm -hmm. And that is like New York as Bohemia. I came back in 1998 and there was an artist who was a good friend of another friend of mine who was an artist. And my friend said, there is no more Bohemia. There is no more countercultural mecca that used to be in New York. And it, it wasn't even about the internet yet. I mean, the internet was coming in, but that wasn't it. I, in fact, I went to, uh, there was a, the, one of the hippest places in New York City in the early 90s was a, a weird zine store where they show, sold all these like magazines, homemade magazines about different countercultural music scenes. And I went into this one store and I said to the guy, actually it was in 2002, it was after September 11th, and right after I came back just to see what the city was like. And, and I went to this guy's store and I said, you know, I left here in 1996 and there doesn't seem to be any new music scenes that are represented by magazines. Usually there'd be like a new music scene every other year there. And he looked and suddenly he got this like weird look in his eyes. He says, you're right. And the place was closed within a year. It had just, wow. that was like, it was the, the sense of being on the edge there was just disappearing. And so um, part of it, by that time, it was all going into the internet, this, the weird chaos of, of different cultures and such. Um, but so there, you didn't need a physical place. But, but no, Todd Phillips was definitely soaked in this aesthetic of, of artistic nihilism and such. And in a way, there was an honesty to that. Because yeah. you know they looked around and they saw. I mean, if you if you looked at someone like G.G. and and you saw the extremes to which, and he was, certainly wasn't the only one going to extremes, the extremes to which people were taking the music and the sounds and and how 
purposely ugly people were making things. And you said to yourself, how much farther can this go? In fact, I remember going to a, uh, a concert at that time by these guys from Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh came in and they were doing noise concerts. And it looked like a rock show, but when you went in there, it was like 45 minutes of the most ear splitting, pure noise I had ever heard. And I went up to the guy afterwards, because by this time I was, I, you know, I'd been studying all this stuff for a while. And I just walked up to him and I said, the point of that was to create pain, cause pain, wasn't it? And he goes like, you got it, you got it, that's it. You know, and then the same week I was talking to some other guy who was doing electronic dance music and he said to me, yeah, I just want to do something that's just involving like pink noise. It's like high, and I just want to people's ears. And it was this kind of like, you know, uh, violent sort of uh, aggressive take, this nihilism wanting, but I think it was all about wanting to, I mean, even G.G. Allen for all his scatological, just, you know, uh, blasphemous actions, was about trying to wake people up to the truth. And of course, his truth was, there was nothing. Right, <laughs> so right. It's like, you're gonna wake up and then what? Right. You know, um, right. there is nothing. Um, but I think Todd Phillips comes out of that. And so you feel that in the Joker. Yes, you do, yes, in, you do. In the movie Joker. And I think Joaquin Phoenix captures that perfectly. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that I think about in this, I mean, I love how you phrased it in terms of this movement from it kind of, it kind of left the city and went up into the cloud, into the internet. And, sure. and, and so then what replaces it, because I remember, you know, just hearing, because I'd be back in New Jersey, just every now and then on home service and things. And then I would hear mm -hmm. these echoes of, of grumbling from people of the city that, you know, you know, basically Disney is destroying the city. Disney right. is destroying the culture. And, right. and, but what, you know, what, when, when that kind of bleeding edge of even nihilism was in the city, at least it was embodied. And so, you know, the, the video that I just released this morning, which was kind of a failed, most of my videos are failed experiments. Was that the two things. hour one? Yeah, it's a two hour one. Yeah, I just watched most of that. Okay, well, you know, so you get to, you know, you get to rationality rules and the, you know, the environmentalists are complaining sure. about the young people who will show up at all the protests right. and give you all the talk, but will clearly not embody, you know, by even making relatively small changes in diet, clearly not embody the, the message. And so, you know, not only, I mean, beliefs but, are just so completely disembodied. Right. Well, the problem is, though, there's a deep misanthropy in the, well, the extreme eco movements. And that is to say, they would much rather save the planet and get rid of the people. Right. You know, and I'm, I am waiting for the day when someone, and you can almost hear it with someone like Greta Thunberg, this anger and, you know, the thing I saw in her, like, speech to the United Nations, it's just like, oh, my goodness, is she disturbed? Yes, yes. You could just see it in her face. Yes. That, 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 you know, just this fanaticism uh, and such. But, you know, I'm just waiting for someone to come along and say, well, the problem is, well, you know, and people have already said humanity is a virus. Yes. I mean, oh, this yeah, has been yeah. said by comedians and rock musicians and Agent movie. Smith. Yeah, for ages. So, just waiting for someone to come along. We need to cure the virus. Well, the we need to eliminate a good chunk of the population. It's Thanos. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and okay. oh, exactly. Uh, except, of course, that's like fun. <laughs> you know, it's a fun Marvel movie, so people don't think about it in terms of themselves. But the truth is, when you see stuff, stuff like the uh, what is it, the Extinction Rebellion people, and the kind of crazy stuff they've been doing in London, or you see just the you know, when people get this look in their eyes, you know, you see it in Antifa, but you can see it on the right as well. This this sense of, we've got to do something. And um, I don't know if you watched any of my time videos, but the most recent one that I put out, it's, it, it, it's I'm talking about evil and time. And the thing about evil, it's interesting, is it always seems to go with entropy and to mm -hmm. increase the entropy, where love 
always goes against entropy. So one of the things I point out is how much easier it is, like if you're walking down, say, a street in New York, how much easier it would be to do some random act of evil or, or it's something that someone would remember for the rest of their lives, even walking up, commenting some snide comment on their nose or making a, pushing someone into traffic or swearing and so on. I mean, the list is endless. But to do anything genuinely loving to someone at random walking down the street is almost impossible because even if you give money to someone, you don't know what they're going to do with that. About yeah. the only things you can do is prevent an act of evil from happening. <laughs> that's true so that's true. love takes time and 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 trust and knowledge uh, and it doesn't happen immediately so we live in a time where people are saying we want to change it now we have to do it now or else and it's that now or else where the evil resides i think that's where joker is also brilliant on that level as well because it 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 shows these people who are going crazy uh, you know, they've connected whatever their message is to Joker, who is not saying the same thing, but he's just like, becomes the god of chaos to them. You know, he, I, I'm convinced that's, that movie is a warning to us that, and I also think the movie is a game changer in the sense that there have been only a few movies that have been serious game changers in uh, history. Psycho was one. And Psycho changed everything and essentially got us ready for the darker movies at the end of the 60s and the 70s. Hmm. But then Star Wars is another because Star Wars creates, although Jaws was a blockbuster before it, Star right. Wars is, a, is, Jaws was like a, a double. Star Wars was a home run, followed yeah. by Close Encounters of the Third Kind a year later. And those, that told the industry, okay, enough of this soul searching existential you know navel gazing you know let's cut this out in fact uh, there's this long western movie uh, uh heaven's gate let's kill that thing in its infancy and uh you know apocalypse now that'll be near the end of raging bull okay it's about dead now uh, king of comedy was one of the last ones like that mm. interestingly enough mm. and uh but, you know, while the 70s style was dying, what was taking over was this new blockbuster mentality, which is we're thoroughly inside of that now with yeah. blockbuster mentality with these kind of like sarcastic uh, postmodern indies on the side. And that became the reigning two strains of filmmaking. But I think that Joker just did something very fascinating. It hit the ball out of the park. And if, if you go back to Psycho, the critics, a lot of the critics hated Psycho when it really? first came out. Oh, yeah. What they year did Psycho loved, come out? 1960. Okay. And they hated it. And then by the end of the year, they were putting it on top 10 lists. Interesting. Yeah, the same critics who like despised it in the New York Times and such. So it's, it, and because I think people felt attacked. Well, yeah, that film does make you feel attacked. Um, but it was something very different that no one had ever seen before. And, and only someone like Hitchcock could have gotten away with it because he was so respected. Um, and I think he just said, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to push the edge. <laughs> you, know. <laughs> you know and um uh, but yeah but i think you know uh you know some people it's amazing the conversation that joker engenders yes and yes. and people you know i saw someone the other day whose film reviews i usually like and she, you could tell she had been reading all the people who were saying this joker is a dangerous movie and such well even the fact that you think it's a dangerous movie you know you have another big problem to explain. How is it making so much money? Well, and and so you know, I you know, I live in a I live in a very multi ethnic area of town. The mm -hmm. the film theater I go to um, mostly you know African American, Asian. Sure. I mean, not a lot of white folks around here. Right. Right. Um, but, but those so are I great went, theaters to go to. Yeah. And so I went to, well, it's, it's kind of a weird, I mean, it's kind of a weird California thing because the city right. of Sacramento built a new commercial area trying uh -huh. to recap money from the more distant suburbs that kind of took it away from them 20 years ago. And so there's this war back and forth between the city and the surrounding communities. Right, right. But anyway, so, so, you know, I look at, you know, it's always interesting going to a, 
going to a movie and looking around at seeing who else is seeing it. And I would so mm -hmm. love, I would so love to, you know, I, I, you can't do it, of course, in, in modern theaters like this, but I would so love to, after a movie like that, turn on the lights and get up in front and say, tell me about what Let's you talk. just saw. You right, know? exactly. Let's talk about this thing. And well, that I, is what I saw here. Really? I mean, the first time I saw it, it uh, was a pretty crowded theater. But when I left, there was about 15 Georgians who were just sitting in different parts of the theater talking about it as the, the, when the credits were finished rolling. And I thought, huh, never seen that here before. And then I went and saw it again so I could uh, get some audio and also just to see it again, but to get some audio for my uh, uh, video. And I thought, okay. Um, and when it was done, they applauded. Wow. This was like a week later. So, so how does this play in a, I mean, I mean, every, I mean, even within, you know, one of the things about the United States that you don't appreciate until you leave it is just how massive it is and how wealthy oh, it yeah. is, but also oh, yeah. how, how diverse it is really, because, and, and not even just ethnic diversity, but, you know, Sacramento is different from the Bay Area, which is different sure. from Southern California, which is different from right. New York City, which is different from New Jersey. And so, you know, all of these, all of the audiences have zip codes and all of the reactions will be different as well. So, sure. you know, watching movies when I lived in the Dominican Republic was always fascinating. It was fascinating to see what movies really got traction and people mm -hmm. really loved in the DR. So a movie like Joker, how does that play in Tbilisi? I mean, what, what, what is the, how does that interact with the culture there? Well, part of it is understanding how all of American culture interacts here. And of course, American culture is the dominant global uh, yes. you know, soft power as yes. far as, yes. you know, so wherever you go, there's American movies. And, and of course, it's really strange talking to people here about uh, New York City, say, or, or you know, California. Yeah, I mean, you know, here's what America is from here. There's New York City, there's Florida, there's Texas, there's California with Los Angeles and San Francisco, maybe Seattle. When I mention Alaska, they seem to know what that is, although some of them might think it's Canada. But basically, that's America, is mm -hmm. these, these points. Yeah. And um, it's funny, you know, it's just, and, but there is an effect of American culture here, or the West in general here. And there's definitely a split here between the people who want to go with the new changes and the people who want to retain their Georgian identity. And some of the people on the retaining the Georgian identity side are quite extreme because they feel completely threatened. In a sense, you can get it with you know the, the idea of Putin and stuff, although these people hate Putin, but still. Um, and then some of the people on the other side think they're being pretty cool because they're getting tattoos and dyeing their hair like a, you know, kind of a washed out green or something like that. And, um, and what's funny though is, uh, you know, I talk to them and I say like, well, you have to understand that to me, even the supposedly coolest person here isn't all that cool <laughs> because you're, you don't get the context, you know, I mean, of either here or Western Europe. And so you're, you know, I had a talk with a girl who's studying to be a lawyer and uh, she was saying like, yeah, we need to loosen up and stuff. And I knew what she was talking about. She, you know, talking about the personal freedoms and all this stuff. I said, yeah, what's funny though, is like, you're on one side of it, we're on the other. You know, you're on the side of looking at those kinds of freedoms saying, wouldn't it be great if our society was more like that? And I'm on the side of saying, well, we got all those freedoms. And I'll tell you, it's becoming a real problem because after a while, one person's freedom fights against another person's freedom and there's no cohesiveness yeah. anymore. And, you know, when I tell Georgians, uh, you know, you know, I've talked to Georgians who you could tell are just like very like in their society, they think they're, they're really out there. And I talk to them, I say, well, let me tell you what's going on there. And I just start relaying events and events and events, you know, like the kind of thing I read today where, you know, uh, what was it? Someone uh, was, 
Well, there was something like last week where a kid was convicted in, in London of, uh, of just, I think it was using a word, <laughs> you know, just one of the words you're not supposed to use. He was convicted of that. And then in Oxford, uh, today it was reported that the clapping has been, is they're, they're thinking of m making it illegal to clap at Oxford. You can only use jazz hands. Oxford. So, you know, this is what, and I tell people the stuff here and they just don't believe it. And I said, yeah, well, the, what you want is you want something between these extremes. Yeah. You yeah. don't want yeah. to just be stuck in the past, but you also don't want to be like, there's no point in trying to be cool. <laughs> you yeah. know, being yeah. cool leads you to a dead end. And I, and when I've talked about the Joker movie, people I go like, and that movie is about the dead end. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's about uh, the kind of things we are struggling with as a society. And they kind of, uh, they don't quite see it like that because they don't have the, all the context, but they certainly realize it's an important film, you know? And what's interesting here is that like, you know, we'll have, uh, we just finished having a Woody Allen retrospective at one of the theaters here. And a couple of weeks back before uh, the latest Quentin Tarantino movie, we had a, Tarantino retrospective. You go there and it's all in English, of course. And, um, but what's interesting is when I talk to people, I've, it's amazing. I've talked to several people who say, yeah, I want to go live in New York City. And I said, yeah, <laughs> I mean, do you have any idea, for instance, how much it would cost to live in New York City? And they go like, yeah. And I start talking to them and they start saying things like I hear the following word, Woody Allen. I'm going like that New York, doesn't really exist anymore. Yeah, that's yeah. the New York I went to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. Know? yeah. The New York. I mean, I always look at my New York was a uh, triangulation between me, Woody Allen, and Taxi Driver. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that's what New York was in about 1980. You know, and yeah. uh, when I went there, and uh, but yeah, it's just it's a totally different place now. And uh, it's so it's so interesting. The so I just. This morning, I finished watching, actually watched it a couple of times, this conversation between Tom Holland and a guy, I didn't know who he was. Um, I, I'll, I'll, you'll be seeing this video because I'll be mm -hmm. making videos from it. Right. But, you know, Holland is, Holland is talking about, you know, the, at the, the coming of, it, he quotes, an, he quotes a, an Indian scholar who basically said, you know, the West... You know, the West basically pushed two religions at the same time. One, of course, was Christianity, and the other mm -hmm. was this idea of secularism and right. and secular culture. And you know, I you know what how you how you just described Georgia is so true. Of so, I was in the Dominican Republic from 1990 to 1990, beginning of 1997, and. You know, there were, uh, so America and the Dominican Republic was Nueva York, which was New York, mm -hmm. and Miami. That was, that right. was America right. for Dominicans. Sure. And, you know, outside of Santo Domingo, New York City has the largest concentration of Dominicans anywhere in the world. Yeah. I used to live near a whole bunch of them, so, <laughs> <laughs> in the Lower East Side. Yeah, and, and so, you know, it's, it's so interesting how... I, I think you I think you phrased it quite right quite correctly that we're we're sort of on the other side of this thing. But you know the the Disneyfication is is a you know is in a sense if if we can't uh, how, how how can I get my words together here? I mean it's I mean, pluralism is of itself a place you can't live because by definition, you might become a, you might become a mosaic of mm -hmm. entities from different cultures, but one person can't fundamentally be pluralistic and maintain yeah. an integral whole. And so what happens is, you know, we, we've, we went from movie theaters where people would, would gather together and to Netflix, where we're watching alone on screens. Now, mm -hmm. you probably don't have Netflix in Tbilisi, 
Um, actually, actually, uh, there is a system here. I won't go into it too much where I get almost everything from Netflix without paying for it. <laughs> yeah, well, that was kind of the Dominican Republic as well. Right, right, you could you right. could get, you know, the rest of the world massively rips off, you know, intellectual property rights. They don't pay for it, but it's, you know, in, in many ways, it's the heart of the American religion, you know, going out with, um, I loved how Jonathan Peugeot mentioned, you know, he was talking about this weird YouTube dynamic people watch you on. And Jonathan Peugeot notes, he says, well, when you're looking at a screen, you're seeing a being of light. And it was like... Mm-hmm huh, huh, this is, this yeah. is really fascinating. But the, how can America, how can America address the pluralism and, and resist the embodiment? Well, well, it does through just essentially through, you know, pure distraction. All we, all we are left to do is distract one another. And we have the, we have the disembodied stories, just a sequence of disembodied stories from you know, a hodgepodge of cultural backgrounds and an incoherent cutting and pasting of messages. And this reminds me of some, some of what C.S. Lewis noted in the Screwtape letters, where, you know, Screwtape notes to Wormwood, you know, the best way to have, the best, the best way to finally guarantee the, the procurement of a, hum, of a human soul is to essentially keep them distracted until they die. Just keep Absolutely. them in one long state Absolutely. of distraction. Right. Don't allow right. any silence in. Don't allow any real thinking in. Just keep them buzzing. Keep them, and then boom. And mm-hmm. and and that's that seems to be, you know, what what America is pushing. And of course, it's 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 broad spectrum. And I, you know, one of the one of the crazy things. I don't know if you see it there, but one of the crazy things is if you go into a a restaurant so there's a there's a chinese buffet just down the road and of course chinese buffets are all over the place and it's a seafood buffet and you go in there and what you see often are families where the entire family is sitting around a table each looking at their own screen they've gone oh, out right to, right they've just gone out to like eat this. that's right yeah. and they're eating and they're going through their screens and then you go even to some better restaurants and you know now you know, I, one of the things I love to do is take my kids out to eat because it's like, you know, there's, there's no screens, there's no distractions. It's, it's pure eating together, but you, you just watch this thing happening and you just say, well, yeah, um, humanity is a virus and, you know, maybe the embodied people will imagine, you know, killing people for the sake of the planet, but, but people seem to be doing that quite readily themselves just by, well, by, the thing is, those embodied them. people are also just as disembodied, <laughs> you know, and yeah, distraction, it's endless. And I, I'm convinced that's why fantasy has become such a big deal. And uh, as much as I like Lord of the Rings, uh, poor old, dear old Tolkien op- opened up a Pandora's box there mm. that you, suddenly everyone else started doing all this world building and creating of stuff. And I know people who are Christians who just get sucked into this hole of, you know, whether it's a, a world on a video game or, a, you know, one of the franchise things, but it's always some bigger thing. It's not, uh, it's not like they're making their own unique worlds or ideas. They're not creating a world where that no one's seen before. They're, they're inventing someone else's version of a fantasy world and then slightly tweaking it to make it their own if they're creating a whole world. But if they're not, then they're totally invested inside, say, Game of Thrones or the Star Wars universe or whatever. They're invested in this thing. I mean, I'm convinced one of the reasons why people got so upset over Game of Thrones ending, it wasn't simply that they thought the, the uh, writing got bad. It's that it ended. Well, I, you know, one of the, what a, a, a real movie moment for me is right there at the end of the Truman Show, mm-hmm. where you have this complete engrossing in this story, of course, with Kristoff in the sky and this right. whole thing. And then, of course, once he walks out the door, gives his tagline, shuts the door, the show goes off. And what do people do? You know, I love that the security guards, let's see what's next on TV. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Where now, today it would be swiping. You know? Right. Well, that's right. Well, and, you know? and I, you know, 
again, I mean, maybe this video is two old guys lamenting the loss of New York City and the loss of the, the world they grew up in. But, you know, I, I talk to people who, you know, I look at these, you know, one of the interesting things in my local meetup that we talk about fairly often is what I call the loss of the, the generational handshake, where, you know, father and mother have children, children mm -hmm. from different families meet, create a new family, have their own children. I mean, this is this genera just generational right. handshake that goes on again and again and again. And that has, sure. that is severely disrupted in the United States. Oh, yeah. and, and part of it is, you know, well, how do you meet someone? Well, I, noticed, I began noticing about 10 years ago that when I would start talking to young couples, maybe I would marry them and maybe they just came into the church mm -hmm. or maybe I just met them. Well, they, nobody would want to say, but they met online. And a lot of right. people would meet online. But of course, that meeting online was something like eHarmony, where sure. there's a little profile. It's sort of like doing a magazine quiz to meet somebody else. And there's right, right, right. And then they chatted for a while, and then one would fly over near the other. And you know, right. so that was 10 years ago, that was the online version. Now, of course, it's in it's in apps. And it's, I mean, I I've never why would I download Tinder? I've been married for 31 years. But I, well, I even Tinder, though, there's something and, and I pointed this out in my most recent uh, discussion on time. There's something evil in the concept because it takes what is the deepest, most important relationship in one's life. The relationship to, you know, one's spouse and turns it into an instant, like there's a photo of someone presenting themselves visually, and there's a brief description that's supposed to tell us something about this person, but it's like, it's not reality. And so people are presenting themselves rather than allowing themselves. What, and here's what I think the Joker did so well, is it stripped off all the masks of the these the CGI superhero extravaganza, you know, and what it said was, no, well, let's look at this as if it happened actually, you know, and let's not play the game that way. And 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 many people pointed out, well, this film could have just been called something else, and it would about been about you know, uh, some guy going crazy or whatever. And if you, but, but then again, no one would have come, <laughs> you know, cause it had to have that name. But that's to me the most subversive part of it is that it had the name Joker. It, it gave the people who wanted their fantasy world that excuse to come. But then when you got there, it did something totally different. And it really forced you to look at this weird strange world and even to think a little bit about the history of those times and its relationship to other films i mean one film that people didn't talk enough about while they were talking about taxi driver and king of comedy is they didn't talk about network and it's a lot like i'm mad as hell and i'm not going to take it anymore. yeah 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 oh yeah yeah well especially given the i mean given the scene on the on the talk show Exactly, you know, which is the climax of the Joker right. movie in some ways, and and that with the, that with network, um, yeah, exactly, very much so. So so well, which I, was know, also one of those very dark seventies films. Oh yes, I mean, oh all, yes. But it's amazing how how dark the films of the seventies were and were very popular. Yes, well the seventies. You know? I mean, and I often think about that now. I mean, the seventies were a dark time. I mean, you had bombings. I mean. You, you oh, really yeah. had a sense that, I mean, yeah. people look at like 1968 and, but 68. That was just the, the beginning. That was just <laughs> the beginning. That's right. Yeah. And no, I, I think that's, I think that's true. And, you know, part of also in, so at the end of the movie, during the, during the riot scene, which is, you know, when he's, mm -hmm. when the King is finally coronated, but again, all of the masks on the crowd. And of course, you know, you connect up with Antifa um and and right. now you know you're gonna have some questions well okay well how does hong kong fit into this but but the you know what that does to a and of and of, of again of course that their clown i mean anybody who's watching this really does have to watch your video on on clowns because again to me that gave so much backdrop but the the emotional the emotional sense of 
okay, you're looking at a mob and they're all wearing these clown masks. And of course the clown mm -hmm. masks they're wearing are, are uniform. It's not a diversity of clown masks. No, no. But, but well, it's those, those, those are a lot like the anonymous mask. That's right. That's right. They're but a lot going. like you're, it. You were talking about. No, but I, you know, I, I, I still haven't processed enough. I, I want to go see the, I, I'm going to go see the movie again and I'll probably well, see it. A did number you of hear times. Uh, the way they really wanted to end the kind of coronation scene when he's, they're all getting around him and he puts the blood on, but what they really wanted to do was have him cut his mouth open. Yeah. So yeah. that he would be actually Keith Ledger a uh, Heath Ledger has that same kind of cut there. Yes, yes. But you, what it goes back to is the man who laughs. Yes. Now, it's a good thing they didn't do that because that would have been a bit too extreme for the movie, I think. But, but I understood it because the man who laughs is all about a guy as your traditional clown image of the, the smile on the outside, the darkness on the inside, you know. And, but what's happened is Victor Hugo invents these comprachicos, who are these people who kidnap people and do things to them to create freaks, you know? And so they, in, in The Man Who Laughs, he's got this huge grin. Uh, Conrad Veidt does an absolutely incredible job. I highly recommend that silent film. It's one of the last silent films. It was made by MGM. Absolutely, I mean, it's just got scenes in it. You're just like, it was it was badly reviewed at the time. They were trying to compare it to the Phantom of the Opera. It's a very different kind of beast because it's obviously it's a tragedy, but with these weird elements in it of this, and it also gives this very interesting view of carnivals and uh, entertainment. Uh, you know, like back in the late seventeenth uh, century, and. Um, which is a time I find very interesting as a Christian because that's the point at which we started to lose our footing in the culture. Uh, you know, if you go to the beginning of the, the Baroque era, all of the, the thinkers and such are Christians. You know, so whether it's Descartes or uh, Christian von Huygens, who invented like telescopes, or Galileo, who he passed the telescope to, or Copernicus. All these people in that, the Renaissance and Baroque era were still Christians. They were using their minds. They were, you know, Christianity and science were not in any sense at odds. And it's only in the period after the, the in, in, when you get to the 18th century, you start getting into what we call the Enlightenment. And that's when you have the break. But that, 17th century period is very interesting. So it's very interesting to go into that in this film. But of course, the whole point is he's laughing on the outside. He's making people laugh on the outside. But inside, he is just so sad. Now, the, the, the actual book is even more extreme. You can imagine it a much bigger grin. Victor than, Hugo's than, book. Uh, yeah, Victor he's Hugo's like, the, the Man Who Laughs. You can imagine a much... I read that a long time ago and was just really struck by it uh, way before I knew there was a movie or, or that the Joker was based on it or anything like that. But Joaquin Phoenix is very, harkens back to the man who laughs because he's physically laughing, but he's not actually laughing. So he's laughing, you know, he's, and so he has this weird condition where he laughs at inappropriate times. Right. Whenever he feels right. nervous, it's a psychological break. And so he just starts this crazy laughter. And that's very much the man who laughs. So if they had done that at the end, there was this whole line of thinking. That's why people who say that to me, it's like, oh, it was just the taxi driver again. It's just like, no. It was like saying Shakespeare was just doing Romeo and Juliet, the same story these other people done. And did Hamlet. Yeah, they already told that story too. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like... Well, it's important to remember that the taxi driver was what, 1975 or 76? 76, this is, yeah. This is a very different world than 76. It's not just because it's set now. And, and you right. know, I think in many ways, that image as you just laid it out, what a powerful metaphor for amusing ourselves to death and, and our culture and the disnification of the culture right. where it's all, right. it's all laughter on the outside, but... Right. Well, that's why one of the things, I mean, I wrote a, about, 
I don't know, six or seven essays about this on my website about the origins of the, this modern concept of fun. And it's a teleological concept. That is to say, we get our meaning from fun. Nobody in history has ever had this concept before. We think it's just normal when people say, as long as everybody's having fun, right? right. That was fun, right? It was, you know, as long as it's fun, it's gonna have be Have fun. Good. That's, the, yeah. that's now the, yeah. it's not be that's, well, good day. It's have no, fun. Exactly. And the strange thing about have fun, and it's capital F fun. It's, yes. it's this, yes. it used to be fun was something like if you went to a carnival. And you'd go there and you'd eat popcorn and cotton candy and you'd ride around on the Ferris wheel or the, or the roller coaster. And for a while, you'd have a little fun and then be done. And you go back to work. You go right. back and everyone would assume you'd just go back to normal life. Right. Uh, fun was you know, like, you know, having a watermelon spitting contest, seed spitting contest. It was, you know, having a picnic could have been fun. Sometimes they weren't fun too if people got into a big argument or whatever. But, you know, that's what fun used to be, this temporary state in which you left. But now with the distraction, you're supposed to stay in the state. Right. Well, and that, if a thing is not fun, that gives you license not to do it. Well, because that, it no longer has meaning. Well, that, that took over church in North America. Oh, yeah. Because, oh, yeah. you know, it... You know, church was, I mean, if you look at forms of, let's say, the, the Dutch Reformed Protestant church that I, I didn't really grow up in it because I grew up in this weird thing in Patterson, New Jersey with black sure, church. Sure. I mean, but You're kind of you on look, the edge of the culture. Right. If you, if you went to, say, a, a real Christian Reformed church in the 1960s and you look around at everything and you understand a little bit about history, well, these are all the people coming to the monarch weekly to, and the whole liturgy enables this to, you know, to greet our monarch, to express our gratitude to our monarch, to give our gifts to the monarch, right. to hear the monarch's mandate for us, and then we go out and implement it. It's a very, it's very much lodged right. in European monarchy, um, the, the liturgy that, that we got brought over by the Dutch to the United States. Sure. So, sure. but then when you get to the seeker movement, you, you get this, so you just watch what the boilerplate becomes for so when I came to Sacramento in the 90s, we were just at the end of the seeker wave of church planting. And the way right. you would plant a church is that you would send out postcards to people. And basically what you would say is, remember church when you were a kid, how boring it was? Well, church isn't <laughs> boring anymore. Right. And that was the way that you would get people into church. And in this world of fun, boring is the sin. That's right. That's right. Boring is the cardinal sin of church. And that, right. that swept the board in church and the whole seeker movement, you know, it, and, and then the idea was there was sort of a bait and switch and evangelicalism right. of course has been doing this for years. You, you know, you like, you know, it's a clown show. You like fun kids come mm -hmm. on in. Mm -hmm. And once we get you in there, then we'll tell you what a sinner you are. And then we'll give you the answer who is Jesus. And then, Okay, now we're going to put you in the clown outfit. You're going to go out and recruit some more kids in. I mean, right. that's how evangelicalism has worked in terms of oh, yeah. evangelization. Oh, yeah. And well, I I tend to think vacation Bible school is like that. Well, that's exactly you know, what it's like. I I tend to think that. I mean, when I first got to Alaska, this small Presbyterian church, we went out and had a ceremony the first Easter I was there where they took a styrofoam cross and they attached a bunch of stuff to it. I don't remember exactly what. Uh, and then they put a bunch of balloons with helium on it and sent it out as a witness. <laughs> of course, the funny thing to me is we're 70 miles from the nearest town. <laughs> You know, this is just going to fall off in the forest and maybe some bear will get the witness. But, you know... <laughs> I'm reminded, though, you remember the Toronto Blessing? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. And that was this weird thing that came kind of before the, I mean, the fun was already entering the church, but it's this weird thing where suddenly all these people were going up to Toronto and having this strange experience in these charismatic meetings where they would just break into fits of uncontrollable right. laughter. Right. And I was just thinking about that as you were talking about the church as, you know, us being like clowns and such. Um, well, this, but it's case, this took yeah, over ahead. eschatology because yeah. when I talk to people today and say, okay, so, so you get the basic Christian narrative. Okay. Jesus died for your sins and that enables you to be able to go to heaven. 
And so, you know, before, just before the seekers, of course, the, the other paradigm was evangelism explosion, where you'd knock on a door, someone sure. answer it, hello, as if they'd actually right. answer the door and not think you're a Jehovah's Witness. And then, and then you would say, um, if you were to die tonight, which is a lovely way to begin a conversation, right. you know, what would you say to Jesus to let him into your heaven? Now, of course, right. if you would try this today in California, you know, <laughs> that, that whole cultural assumption is just completely gone. Sure. But so then the idea was, okay, now heaven is the safe harbor, but all the focus is, of course, on hell. And, right. you know, why does the devil get all the good music? And right. so, but now heaven is for people, I think, just maximal fun forever and ever. And I think that's how yeah. people imagine. So that sure. is now taken up eschatology. Right. Well, here's the thing. So as I trace back, there's another concept that goes with this that I get into as well in my essay site, The Anadromous Life, and that is cute. Yes. We often think of, you know, we're surrounded by these images of big-eyed creatures with little mouths, whether it's coming from Japan or coming from Hallmark cards or whatever, you know, but, and we tend to think somehow that's normal. And it's actually a very recent development. If you go back 100 years, it, the, the concept is hardly there. Right. And, and I realize what this stuff all is, is it's a, a, a weird spinoff of romanticism and the romantic philosophy of, of putting it on uh, your feelings and emotions. And, and it and becomes this thing of sentimentality. And I always define sentimentality not as just simply having emotions, but as having inappropriate emotions, uh, emotions mm. which are not appropriate to the object of that emotion. Now, this goes back of about 150 or more years where you started getting this reaction. But for instance, in Christian churches, you see it the first time when people like Dwight Moody and uh, these people went out and did these evangelistic rallies with like Homer Rotaheber. Boy, I'm bringing in some nice names here now. Homer Rotaheber, uh, there's a new one to me. Yeah, well, the, you know, he Rotaheber, I believe, was the one who wrote In the Garden. That song, oh. he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me. I I'm come to the own. garden alone while the bloom is still on the meadow. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, yeah, that's. Now that's that is total, uh, you know, romantic mush. Uh, in both senses of the word, of both being like kind of romantic and dreamy, but also it's, it's you could call it the, the dying, uh, the heretical version of real romanticism. And, but it enters the Christian church around, the, around 1885. And uh, prior to that, the churches had all been more dour and you know like kind of glum and you would go there they'd be very you know most protestant churches like we don't want any art on the walls we we want really nice you know some churches no organs you know dutch were fortunately smarter than that but sometimes. you know but but huh sometimes <laughs> sometimes yeah yeah well there's always these these weird uh sectarian arguments about that stuff and i've met a few people from churches without any uh musical instruments and whatnot but um but then what happened was it was through these evangelistic rallies, you know, next stop on the line was like Billy Sunday, eventually get to Billy Graham. And each of these people had like their singers with them. So Billy Graham had George Beverly Shea. And you remember those uh, yep. Billy Graham meetings and such. But what they did was they appealed to the emotion. Now, if you go back to uh, Dwight Moody and his man, Homer Rotaheber, Rotoheaver was influenced by what was then the blooming, just beginning to be commercial music. Mm -hmm. Commercial music is not something that is eternal. We tend to think, oh, there's always been pop music. No, there hasn't. You know, I think it starts with minstrel music in America, which is a whole subject I've done quite a bit of research on. And it's the most taboo subject in America. But I also find it one of the most fascinating because that's the first time, not only do you get people playing banjos and it's the origin of country music, it's also the origins of things like the barbershop quartet and Broadway musicals. That is, you get these people playing, you would have a man pretending to be a black man on a plantation, a slave, singing about his mammy, but he's white with this black face. And so what you get is someone you know, singing this sentimental song, it doesn't really sound like anything black people sang, 
But what it is, it doesn't quite sound like the older European song sound either. They've kind of blended it, but they've turned it into this commercial thing. And it was, what most people don't realize is that the most successful music in America has ever had that lasted the longest was minstrel music. Because really? it started in the 1830s. And there were still minstrel shows in the 1950s. Wow. And Amos and Andy was from minstrel type shows. And that went into the 1960s. Really? Because I've, I've heard of Amos and Andy, but I'd shows. never heard of it. Bing Crosby was in minstrel shows. And there are several films where he puts on blackface. Really? Uh, there was a, a revival of the Al Jolson's life when they put out a movie of his about right after World War II in 1946, the Al Jolson story. And my mother performed in blackface when she was in junior high school around that time because she was so struck by it. So minstrel music just is this long history, but it's also essentially a lot of American pop music from the early part of the 20th century. If you want to understand what minstrel music is, is just put blackface on all those people and you pretty much know what minstrel music was like. Interesting. It was all of, it was the same. What happened was slowly they took the, 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 the paint off, you might say. And so, that became American popular music. So connect that then into... Okay, so, so what happened was then the commercial music that was coming from this secular form starts blending in with also, there was the English music hall styles coming at the end of the year. Uh, and they were also very much influenced by this romantic thing as well. And came, and that was like folk music that was turned into the sweeter stuff. They all blended together and started to create the new Broadway stage. But you have these, I can always tell these tunes from the beginning of the end of the uh, 19th century, uh, first part of the 20th century. They all sound like they're from the carnival. They have this. Da, 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 yes. Da, you know, yeah. oh, my heart, there rings a melody. Yeah, that, that's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And they all have this feeling. If, if you start to imagine all those being played on a circus calliope, you're not going to be very far wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. So, well, but, roller but, skating. I, I always, because we, in junior high, we'd go to these, this yeah. roller rink and they had a little organ and it was like a calliope. Right. And, you know, then I'd go to some churches and say, this is just like I used to hear in the roller rink. Exactly. Um, but it's, yeah, yeah that's exactly. right. Yeah, because it's all from the same place. And, what happened was this music became the dominant strain for white America. Uh, up, up by the time you got to say the 1960s, this is what everyone was listening to. You know, the, the Gaithers and, and these yeah. various uh, pop records that were done at that time. And so then came along the Jesus movement and they kind of challenged it and then they made it worse by adding <laughs> the, yeah there's a period in the 70s where it's, there's a challenge to that of why does the devil have all the good music right. uh, you know larry norman but then what happened was the commercial structure come goes into place and uh and by the end of the uh, 1980s all that stuff now is just a market and it's also filled with sentimentality so in a sense, what happened was the sentimental thing was like a drug that, that the Christians took. Now, the Christians weren't the only ones. The whole culture, American culture, has taken that drug. But what happened was the American culture was starting to get serious challenges to it by things like the hippie movement, although the hippies were totally romantic. But by the time you got to the punks, no, this was something totally different. You had, this was a group of people saying, I don't want that stuff anymore. Um, or even uh, good rap music is like, I don't want that stuff anymore. You know, it's like, I want something more real that represents something that I know. Um, whereas this stuff almost always comes from above. It's sold to us. It's packaged. I look at it as the musical equivalent. Pop music in America is the musical equivalent of McDonald's hamburgers. That is to say, it is... It someone the other day was uh, online. I was they were they were criticizing what I was saying about something, and and they said, uh, <clears throat> "Oh, I, we were talk, It was about Marvel movies, and they, I had written something like, "Yeah, well, Scorsese was right when he said Marvel movies are like theme parks." And this person said, "You don't know what you're talking about. I felt something when I saw, you know, went to uh, Endgame, and I go like, "Yeah, and I I taste something when I go to McDonald's too, but it's not necessarily <laughs> nutritious." <laughs> <laughs> you know? 
you know, but what it is is McDonald's does what this music does, what the whole culture does, is it finds the lowest common denominator that will make you feel something, and it's a substitute. You know, we get back to distraction. That what the distraction in pop culture gives you, the 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 bad parts of pop culture is they give you a substitute emotion. So rather than feel real pain, I mean, I've been to funerals that just make me want to just just shoot myself <laughs> because there's no real emotion there. You know, someone's playing some piece of music on a recording that someone had, the, the, the terrible music that uh, is played, the sickening sweet music that is played at the funeral home, or, you know, I went to one Christian funeral where they were singing Shine Jesus Shine during the song, which is like one of the most frightening uh, pop, Christian pop praise songs I've ever heard, you know, and, but that's what's happened is it's taken over. Now, the funny thing is, as the culture is tempted to come out of it, Christians are left holding the romantic bag. And suddenly it looks like we're the only ones holding it. But of course, wherever you find Disney culture, Disney culture holds it. You know, people who grow up with- But just with the, better budgets. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and people who grow up uh, in the, listening to like a lot of the, what's happening in musicals, uh, they too are, you know, really holding that romantic, sentimental bag. But then again, Marvel movies are totally sentimental. Star oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Totally sentimental. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, American movies, I mean, even comedies, if you go to even these really scatological comedies made by people like uh, uh, Judd Apatow and Seth Rogen and Todd Phillips, they will often end with everyone, everything works out okay, and it's a yeah. sentimental ending, yeah. even yeah. though the, what you've been watching has just been like, ugh. <laughs> You know, yeah, it's just, yeah. you know, um, and that's, it's such a, that culture, but that, I think that culture is beginning to wear on us and create yes. the disturbances yes. in our, in our uh, psyche, you know, to use a Freudian, uh, Freudian union term there. Just well, there's a lot of dissatisfaction, there's a lot of dissatisfaction <laughs> with, you know, there's a lot of dissatisfaction with, of course, what Disney is doing to Star Wars. And mm -hmm. the last, um, the last Star Wars movie, I think it came out a couple Christmases ago. And I thought, oh, let's, let's you know, I'll, I'll buy some tickets and kids sure. are home from college and we'll all go together. I'm really curious what they're gonna have to say. And so, right. all you know, most of, at least the family is living in Sacramento. We all went to Star Wars. And it was so interesting because after the movie, because you know, they're, they're, in, they're in the family, they're in the car on the way back home. And so I could hear what they think about it. Most of the kids were like, I'm never gonna go see one of these again. I thought, right. That's right. interesting. Well, here's the interesting thing is the Marvel movies ended this year. Uh, the, that, the one particular series. Right. Uh, Star Wars is ending this year. They're supposedly are going to try to wrap up whatever the kind of chaotic mess they've created. Um, and there have been other things that have been ending. Oh, Game of Thrones ended this year. Yeah. But what started this year? Joker. Well, you see, and that's and interesting. And what I mean by that is that I think we're going to look at the 20s when we get there, yeah, as being, oh, Joker was the beginning of the 20s in, mm -hmm. in movies. Just like Psycho was the beginning of the, what we'd call the new Hollywood of the 70s, even though it was 1960. It took a while for that effect, right. along with all the foreign movies and other uh, things that had happened. But that was the first sign that, oh my goodness, what is this thing? So you think there's and, gonna be more to come in terms of what we saw in Joker coming down yeah, the line? Yeah. Well, it's that, I think what we're going to start seeing is we're going to start seeing these things, the other things failing more. Because it's just like at the end of uh, the 70s, we already had Star Wars in, what was it, 77? 70, you know, Seven, like Star that. Wars was 75, and then no, I no, think... No, no, no. Uh, 76 was the, the dark year, and that was uh, Taxi Driver Network Carry. 77 was, I think, uh, but that the was Empire also Strikes Back. Rocky. So I think yeah, it was the Rocky. next year. Okay. So the next year after Rocky was Star Wars. So, uh, but it was that it didn't immediately change Hollywood. That is to say, people then uh, by the 1980 or so, it was like you'd get one of these movies a year. And then what started happening is you, after a while, the whole industry started saying, we really have to knock them out of the park every time. We need this big deal. So you started getting these event movies. But I think the event movies are 
you know, killing. What, what's an event movie? Uh, the event movie, movie is something like Endgame. It's something okay. like the next okay. Star Wars film. It's this big okay. thing you know is coming. Okay. You know, and, uh, you know, it, of course, Mar um, the Marvel D universe is like all events. You know, everything yeah. Star Wars is an event movie. So after a while, what Disney's been doing is, uh, you know, milking the cow dry. They're, then they're, they're, you know, a lot of people think like, okay, the next, you can already see what's going to happen with the next round of Marvel movies. And that is they're going to follow the, uh, the Captain Marvel, sorry, I got a hair in here. Captain Marvel wokeness. You can see it coming. And you can see stuff like that happening also with the, the normal DC stuff. But Joker isn't the normal DC stuff. Oh, that's right. Well, wa there was a lot of discussion I heard because apparently Joaquin Phoenix does not do sequels. And I thought one of the most critical things about Joker is that there is no Batman. And, you yeah. know, he's you now you see little Bruce Wayne. And, but, but, you know, I think, I think they're, I mean, especially if they manage to leave it just hanging out there on its own. Well, one thing you can be sure they're doing is putting some serious pressure on him. I'm sure they are. <laughs> <laughs> especially after they saw the box office. And the funny thing about that is that's gone around the world with big numbers. I mean, really? that was selling out here, <laughs> you know? And we don't have that culture here. Yeah. But, but like I say, I think uh, it's the kind of thing that people recognize, it, it, it hits something on a lot of levels. And, um, and, and to get back to what we were talking about at the beginning of this culture of fun, the clown, the clown, it's the strangest thing. The clown who used to be the figure of that older version of fun, you go to the circus and they'd be the clowns yeah. and you would laugh, yeah. has become horror in the new world that we now live in where fun is our daily life. But who is this strange figure here? who reminds us of different kind of, well, uh, and what's funny is it's not just the Joker or it's not just uh, clowns, but it's anything that feels handmade and strange from the past. Mm -hmm. So you can find people's creepy old Halloween masks when people just make masks out of burlap sacks or, or paper bags or whatever. And you find these old photos of that and people say, ooh, that's creepy. It's handmade stuff. But you see, I think they're also secretly, they're looking at this handmade stuff and say, this is a lot more interesting than the culture we have, which doesn't feel handmade, which feels, you know, I mean, if I walk, there's, there's a mall or two here. You walk into them and you could be in any country USA, you know, it's like any city that has a mall they're around the world. They all kind of look alike. You know, we live in a time when everyone's looking at their palms, at their... And it's the same culture on there. You're seeing the same thing. So in a sense, I think we see a, we're seeing a, a battle in a sense between the, the new things, which are sleek and shiny and all basically, they're kind of a lie. And the old things, which were handmade and rough hewn and, uh, you know, it, I mean, just the quality of work that used to go into, say, furniture is just amazing. So any old piece of furniture now is considered some sort of treasure because our new furniture is so bad, you know. And, you know, I, I of course, I've gone into all this with texture and stuff. But it's because, and I find this is what makes puppets interesting, is that it's the texture. It's the fact that they have this handmade quality. I'm not talking Muppets here. I'm talking... Right you know, the, the kind of stuff that's very uniquely one of a kind. Yeah. And I think one of a kind, <laughs> I think, you know, it's funny how oftentimes this stuff gets called creepy. And I think that's an interesting word. And, and it's a word that's evolving. You know, girls often use that these days. It used to be creepy was like kind of scary, but now it's, it's used in strange ways. So a younger girl looks at an older man and he looks at her the wrong way or something and go, ooh, he's creepy. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Or you look at an old Halloween mask and a photograph from like the year 1900 and you're like, ooh, that's creepy. It's this weird, I don't know what it is. It's, it's, it's related to things like age and it's related to things yes. like, like uh, you know, uh, what used to be considered haunting or haunted is now this weirder word, creepy, which is developing and still 
g gaining new momentum as far as what it means. But I, I have hope, and this is the reason why I got interested in puppets as an alternative to so much of the modern culture. Uh, I have hope that there is, you know, it's kind of like if you don't have vitamin C after a while, you, something starts going wrong with your body. And I think we're missing some ingredients that have been stripped out of our, the nutrition that makes up a, uh, a culture, the, the ecological nutrition of what a human environment needs. And we're starting to feel the effects in our souls of these things. And so as we do, we start to look out at, you know, that's what gets me about puppets. I go like, oh, there's a lot of nutrition there, just, just visual nutrition, because it doesn't feel like anything you would find in, you know, uh, just all the replicated uh, kinds of material. It feels like something dense. It's like, that's why I like Alaska. That's why I like the mountains in Georgia or the old streets here that we have these wonderful buildings, but they're all on these dilapidated streets and stuff. Um, and at one point, the, there was a president here who wanted to get rid of a whole block, a neighborhood of just the most beautiful, old, strange buildings to put up new uh, pieces of junk and people protested here and they kept that and it's an amazing neighborhood but that's because these the, you know a lot of people in power think what people want is this new shiny stuff well they can be tricked into wanting but what they really want is it's just like they really want not just an internet community but a real community what they really want is not just uh, to live in a white box in an apartment, but they want to, you know, they really do like wood and, and these natural uh, things. And, and um, uh, there's the story of, uh, maybe I've told you this before, but there's this, there was this old story. This was actually in a Christian, like Jesus people magazine. It was called uh, the parable of the, uh, the orange juice. And uh, this guy uh, uh, is, he spends his whole life doing nothing but, he drinks Tang and he drinks uh, like uh, Kool-Aid, orange. He loves hmm. these flavors. And one day someone says, he says, yeah, I really like orange juice. And they look at him and they go like, that's not really orange juice. He goes like, yeah, but I really like it. He goes like, yeah, but it's really not orange juice. And they go, so the person recommends to him that he go down to the, the uh, refrigerator section in the store and they get one of these cans that has the uh, concentrated orange juice. And you take that and you pour it and you mix it up. And then the guy tries that and he tastes it and goes like, wow, this is so much better than that. I really love this. This is like, so, you know, it's just like orange juice. And then one day someone says to him, so goes like, that's not really orange juice. <laughs> <laughs> and they go like, what do you mean? And they go like, well, look, they're, they're having a sale on oranges right now. Well, let me do this for you. So the guy takes it and cuts the oranges and, and, and squeezes them all and gives them fresh squeezed orange juice. And the guy goes, oh my God, this is the real thing. And I think it's the real thing that we have yeah. been lacking. And what's happened is for, for quite a while, uh, our culture was living on the concentrated orange juice. Now we're actually living on Tang and Kool-Aid. I mean, that's where our culture has moved. So artificial, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, we're so mediated between things. Uh, there's so little reality left to what we call life. But the thing is, deep in our hearts, we're still looking for orange juice. We don't even know it. But once you get it, you suddenly go like, oh, this is, th there's just a glimmer of this taste in the, this, these bad chemical things. And then it was kind of like it in this frozen thing, but this real orange juice. So it's like, to me, that's, that's what I'm seeking to pass on to people. A little bit of whatever knowledge I have of orange juice, you know. <laughs> well, even even though I think we could keep on going for another couple of hours and keep that's you up all night, that's probably a good place to stop because I I think that's a beautiful. That's a that's a very that. that that brings me to C.S. Lewis. And one of these days, so I've, re I've read The Discarded Image, so I, am, I do want to talk to you about that book. Oh, sometime. yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, I mean, because that's very Lewis, because it's, you know, Lewis, of course, mm -hmm. had this idea, you know, that, okay, so we're tasting, we're living here on Tang, but our hearts long for oranges, but we've never, I always say orange in a Jersey way, our, our right. hearts long for oranges in a world that we've never seen one. And yeah. so, 
No, I think that's yeah, you good. probably go on you probably go on tour instead of tour too. <laughs> <laughs> But, I have, but speaking of uh, Lewis and the discarded image, I actually have just made two uh, videos of book recommendations. Oh, good! Uh, that I haven't put on on yet. I'm I'm waiting okay. to put on one more time one, and then I'm going to put them up. But I've got them finished, and uh, they are uh, one of them deals with like all Inklings related stuff, and I really get into the the deeper works of. I, I don't do the obvious. I do all the the stuff like discarded image, experiment criticism, uh, preface to Paradise Law, stuff like that. But I also deal with Barfield and Charles Williams and uh, and other people related to him, like Dorothy Sayers and such. Oh, like wonderful! That. So, and then the second one is like the Russians, like Solzhenitsyn, and also people like Jacqueline and and Walker Percy and such. So, so anyway, so you'll have my take on uh, discarded image there. Oh, Someday good. We'll talk about it. Yes. Well, send me send me a send me an email with any of the links you want me to include with this, and so sure. I'll I'll you know get them out there. And but thank you, thank you so much. And well, it's good know, to talk to you again. It's oh, been it's a while. I yeah. haven't wanted to. Uh, I you know I'll let a bunch of other people talk because I got my own forum now, so I get out there and blab and I, I you know. But it's great talking to you. And well, so uh, I'd love to see more people watch your channel because again, you have. I mean, I. I used to have a friend, I used to have a friend here in Sacramento who went to this church. His name was Neil Hand. He used to be the buyer. He was the buyer. He was the classical and opera buyer for Tower Music when Tower oh, Music yeah. was in its heyday. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. he was such an encyclopedia for me of, of pop culture and movies. And of course, he was a huge opera fan. So we knew everything. about. He died and left 12,000 records in the house you know, in the house that his poor widow had to figure out what to do with, and at least as many CDs and cassette tapes. And so it was just right, right. But, but, you know, I don't have him. I anymore, understand. So that. Yes, <laughs> I really, I really appreciate this, you know, getting to talk to you and, and getting to hear you, you know, share yeah. everything that you've accumulated through your lifetime. So it's, it's a, yeah, really well, there's, gift. there's lots more. Part of the reason I'm doing these channels is just to get stuff out of my head because I I'm haunted by the fact that I've I've spent so much time thinking about this stuff and I I do write but it's you know it's going too slow so this gives me a chance to at least say okay some of the stuff's getting out of my head and uh, you know there's lots more to go but you know at least I can say okay I mean that's one of the reasons I'm putting my time series out there is because I think that's one of the most important things that I come across in my life. So I'm trying to put these things out there in a way that other people can at least say, oh, there's something there maybe, and, and have a look at it, you know? But uh, yeah, there's lots more to go though. Well, send me the links that you want in here and we'll put them down and hopefully more people will migrate over to, and, and the problem is you're like me, you put these massive videos out and, and you have to be ready for long form to, to digest your stuff, so. Yeah, although I do have a short one coming. I'm just going to talk about the time elements in the series Dark, which oh, I find okay. really fascinating. And there was a whole thing in that where this one character says, God is time and we're here to kill God. <laughs> and which, which dovetails perfectly with my ideas about time and God, yes. because it's like we relate to God through time and you know, in our, our time life. And, but but the thing is, it's like the, when I heard this, I was like, oh, and so I just recorded, I, I went and purposely jacked it off the screen. It's all in German, so I had to get make sure I had subtitles. <laughs> and, uh, but just a short section, just because I felt it was important. And there's some other stuff that I, I, I want to do that's shorter. When I say shorter, I mean like under 20 minutes. <laughs> well, I'm, but, I'm glad you live outside the intellectual property police state. So although oh, yeah. YouTube is within it. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. I get, I get copyright claims all the time. The way it is now, my most recent time video, I, I didn't even play the music, but I, I put some of the imagery from a video by Billie Eilish, who's this current singer who's, who's interesting and strange at the same time. And I made a comment on it, and I got immediately copyright struck by Universal Music. Uh, not struck, but claimed. And then right. they rejected it. You Normally, I... I get the fair use thing, but I'm yeah. going to actually go back one more time and say, well, wait a minute. 
I can use this. I don't even use the song at all. I'm just using some imagery. And, and it's an important point to discuss or use of fashion and becoming a visual image, you know? So it's like, yeah. anyway, it's, it's what it is. Well, Paul, have a good uh, morning. Uh, day. I guess it's, uh, yeah, it's still morning. It's almost noon. Yeah. And right. I will have a good night. <laughs> okay, Bern. Great talking to you. We'll talk again. Okay. Take okay. care. Bye-bye.